So for today, uh, to start, I guess, the year, I chose a paper which is from January 1st of this year uh, that we saw recently in one of our meetings. Um, and this paper, the last author is Mike Gandal, uh, who gave a talk at Libre a couple months ago. It's part of Psych and Code and has led a lot of the analysis in, in Psych and Code Consortium. Um, and uh, like I met him in person a couple of times. Um, he's a very uh, nice guy. Um, and so this is a review paper um, about uh, like psychiatric disorders um, and how like all the different types of data that we're using as a field to try to understand psychiatric disorders more. Um, and uh, let me close Zoom. Um, right. So <clears throat> I didn't have time to, to make slides about this paper. There's also only two figures on this paper. Um, but I, I'll show it. Uh, I was thinking of just like uh, telling you like what page it was on, but because it's an open access paper, I think there's no uh, problems in, um, in actually uh, going through it in, in detail, um, like because of the recording and all that. So, um, right, so several of the issues about like studying psychiatric disorders is that there's pleiotropy, which means that a, a, a single gene can have more than one function. Um, there's um, uh, the, the variants that we think are causing the, these, these disorders, the genetic variants have incomplete penetrance. That means that like um, they're not like uh, ubiquitous. It's not like every single patient has that variant type of thing. Um, and some of the variants that we found have involved like known coding um, regions of the genome, which are like harder to understand because we don't know what their functions are very well sometimes. Um, plus there's also like temporal issues of like, uh, we don't know exactly when the variant is playing a role if it's like, for example, in prenatal life, uh, or is it like uh, at some other stage? Um, so, <clears throat> um, so yeah. So here um, they talk about like the um, uh, there's a liability use here because because uh, we don't understand all or like we don't. It's hard for us to measure all about like the genetic variation and its heritability. Um, uh, these variants that we find, they're challenging um, uh, because of some of the reasons I just mentioned, pleiotropy, complete penetrance. There's a lot of functional annotations for a given variant, and that's part of like how uh, sometimes our knowledge about the genome is, is very limited. Um, or if it's brand new, then we might have more than one interpretation of what a gene is doing or what a variant is actually doing. Um, um, and so uh, one possible way forward is to try to find the actual molecular pathways that are, are being uh, that are, um, being affected by these disorders. Um, and so uh, that's like the big overview. Now, like to actually talk about psychiatric disorders, we really need to be studying the brain, uh, the human brain. And why do we need to study the human brain? That's because like uh, uh, there's a lot of like known coding RNAs that are and, and isoforms that are unique to the brain. Um, and actually, like here, there's, they have the sentence that says that two thirds of the of the genes that are expressed in the brain um, uh, are detected in blood. So that means a third is absent in blood; it's not expressed in blood, um, which makes everything a little bit more challenging because. Blood is something you can um, study from individuals that are alive, right? Um, uh, brain is not something you can just easily access, right? <laughs> um, um, and so because we need to be studying the actual human brain, uh, like getting enough samples and, um, um, and the type of studies that we're able to do is really limited. Um, so, <clears throat> Also, because we're mostly working with post-mortem 
samples. Um, close more thing over here. Uh, we there's also like degradation effects um, based on like uh, when we're able to get those samples. Um, um, so that just add, compounds to the challenges that we're facing. Um, um, the good thing for us is, or like uh, for scientists, is that, uh, or you know, people studying these disorders in general, is that um, across the cortical regions and across individuals and even across studies, so that means even across like different um, um, issues with the data generation, like uh, a lot of the transcriptomic architecture seems stable for the human brain. Um, now, there's also newer things. Uh, newer methods, so like the ability to generate uh, organoids or neurons um, from the human brains that we uh, have uh, is potentially going to enable us to do other types of uh, experiments. So like, for example, like um, seeing how like the organoids respond to a given drug or, the, or a neuron to a given drug or a given change. However, like those, um, there's like, Right now, there's, they still have um, differences between what we're able to study in those models versus what actually happens in the brain. Um, so that's part of the challenge. Like, where, where do we get the data? The next part is like, uh, okay, like we have different methods uh, for studying RNA seq or expression, and so um, not only should we be studying like the, the annotated genes, but we should also be looking at like known coding genes, looking at splicing events, and uh, and trying to find like new unannotated uh, regions of the, of the genome that are active. Um, and so for this, there's been like recent developments in, in genomics in general for like uh, a, being able to obtain full length isoforms among other things. Um, However, with like all the RNA seq um, methods, quantifications, and there's often like a lot of technical factors that play a role. And so we'll we'll see if you're tuning a little bit over here. Um, and so to try to minimize those technical factors in general, like people have um, uh, recommended that we should try to use um, uh, randomize our samples when possible, um, but also like try to process them together. So this is where like, um, like as a scientist, instead of being, a, instead of generating like um, a couple of samples in every single lab, a lot of the efforts have been concentrated in, in like fewer locations where the idea is to try to gener generate as much data from those locations as possible. Um, 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 once we have that, well, then we need to correct for uh, some of these experimental um, or technical uh, factors as possible. However, the problem with correcting is that sometimes you might be actually removing a um, true signal. Uh, so there's always like a balance between are you um, ultra conservative or not when you're correcting. Um, and so we've seen these also ourselves, for example, um, with some of the methods we use, right? Um, like sometimes, um, like, like I on a naive model, for example, differential expression in schizophrenia, we can find like thousands of differential expressions. But like once we start uh, correcting for potential issues, then we end up with a list of let's say 50 genes. Um, that was the case, for example, in the Brain Sequence 2 project. Um, um, so that's part of like the challenges that we, we know uh, come with uh, uh, analyzing RNA seq data. Um, now, to also analyze it, you can you can uh, build like models of how the genes interact with each other, and the, this where like WGCNA comes into play. So here, uh, the acronym WGCNA stands for Weighted Gene Correlation Network. Uh, wait, sorry, Network Analysis. Yeah, um, WGCNA. Right. Uh, so that's one of the popular methods, and like uh, I, groups at the Libre Institute have used WGCNA. However, like uh, one of the most common um, hubs is uh, tends to be actually highly associated with like cell type specific markers, and that's because like the different cell types in the given brain regions play a um, 
play a pretty strong role in um, genetic variation, or sorry, gene, gene variation, gene expression variation. Um, so um, uh, depending on whether you adjust or not for cell type markers, your um, WGCNA results will give you, will find you different things. Um, so let me go to figure one here a little bit and zoom in more. Um, so I like this figure quite a bit here. Uh, like they're trying to show here on panel A, like the different ways uh, that we can measure information. Um, and so we can look at the DNA, the, the genome or the genetic variation, right? So we mostly look at uh, DNA genotyping in, in, uh, in these cases, but there's, we could also do like whole genome sequencing and get every single base of the, of the DNA. We measure a lot of RNA that actually gets translated into proteins. We, as a field, I don't think we have a lot of, of protein data yet. Are the proteins then they they uh, play a role in the, like in the cells? And so we have measured, um, we have generated data at the cell level. Um, and there's also uh, ways of studying actually just synapses, which like are collections of cells. Um, we don't actually, us, we don't actually uh, work a lot with synapse data or secret information, but eventually the idea is that um, uh, all those signals get aggregated and they generate cognition. Um, 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 so we go to the, um, um, how the cell plays a role or like how the different um, types of RNA play a role uh, in the middle here of panel B. Uh, we can try to find associations between changes in the transcriptome as a whole and either the DNA side. No, normally we're focusing on, on, on risk variance from, the, from um, uh, DNA genotyping or GWAS uh, studies. Um, but we can also look at differences in expression between let's like, say cases and controls um, um, and investigate those differences in the transcriptome. And so this picture of the transcriptome actually looks very, fairly complex and that's because uh, a lot of times we're, we're trying to study the pre-mRNA, sorry, not the pre-mRNA, the mature mRNA, um, mRNAs over here. But before we get to a mature mRNA in a given cell, the, um, there's pre-mRNAs that need to be spliced out. But then there's also like no coding RNAs that go through a different mechanism, a different biological mechanism. Um, um, and some of them end up being long non-coding RNAs. We could also find circular RNAs, and then there's all these other smaller ones like microRNAs, pRNAs, um, siRNAs, um, uh, which we don't uh, study when we're looking at um, RNA sequencing data sets because the um, uh, experimental protocols for the library preparation um, um, eliminate those basically from, from um, the pool of RNAs that we're able to study. Um, so there's there's different experimental protocols for trying to study some of these, right? Um, and uh, right now, I guess the cheapest and easiest is like looking at mature mRNA or the most stable one, uh, high, higher throughput. And that's where most of the data is concentrated on um, right now. Um, but then there's also like the context and so they, talk about here about like the developmental context, like, um, uh, like we're looking at a prenatal uh, uh, brain um, versus let's say like um, a newborn versus like someone who is a child versus an adult, etc. So the brain changes over time. Uh, and it's not like we have like a ton of samples, right? Like, like because we can only study the human brain and we can only get so few of them, right? Um, it's hard for us to, get, to develop like the full picture across development, uh, but then also across the different cell types because each of these brain regions in the brain can change quite a bit. Um, like the cortical, cortical ones seem similar um, among them, but like, uh, but the other brain regions are tend to be really different. 
So the cellular composition uh, can affect all these um, studies that we're doing, and that can, ref can be reflected on the networks, like on the WECNA. Plus there's also like newer ways of looking at expression, like for example, spatial methods for looking at um, gene expression in a specific re uh, like sections of the brain instead of like maybe regions. Um, plus um, sexual differences um, um, in expression. So like the picture is really complex, right? Um, and so in any given study, we are only able to look at a portion of it. We're not able to look at everything together in general. Um, let me zoom out a bit. Um, when, so this is the second and last year of this review, uh, which I'll try to zoom again into. And so, that's actually how we found this paper because we're looking at uh, Brand's partition, which, which is a um, bioconductor package that we had an art club session on last year. Um, and so this package allows us to model the percent of variance explained, which in this case they're showing it as a proportion between zero and one on the X axis. Um, and we have little box plots, which are like, you can't really, you almost don't see the boxes because they're so small or most of them. Um, and you mostly just see the outliers over here, but we can measure like um, the proportion of variance explained across, let's say a set of genes that pass some filters, um, some expression filters um, for different variables. And so this particular plot is showing the percent of variance explained for the um, anterior cingulate and frontal cortex samples from uh, GTEx version eight. It was 629 brains. Um, and it's showing that data because the GTEx uh, consortium has a lot of like technical information about how the samples were generated. Um, and at the top, we have the residuals. So that's the percent of variance that is not explained by the model. And it's pretty high. The box here goes almost from like a little bit above 0.25 brands explained to like above 0.5. That's the range of that box, uh, which is hard to see like the actual like uh, whiskers of the box lot. Um, maybe if I zoom in more. Um, but anyway, the picture here is like, there's a lot of percent of variance explained that is not explained by anything in the model. Um, the rest of it, like brain region plays a strong role over here in, in red. Um, um, uh, a lot of technical information about the process of generating the data, which is, I mean, this uh, darker blue color uh, dominates the, the, um, this landscape. Like a lot of the variables over here are technically related. So for example, the first one over here, the reads mapping to mitochondrial DNA um, uh, or like mapping to adapters, uh, like whether the end uh, in one map reads, I forgot what one that is. Um, anyway, there's a lot of technical um, variables here that explain a lot of variance. But brain region is one. Um, sex doesn't explain a lot of the variance for most of the genes, but for some of them, it explains a lot. As you can see here on the right, um, age or race. Um, uh, I mean, in GTEx, they don't have a lot of races if I remember correctly. Um, and that's like part of the problem with like where we're getting the data from. Uh, but you can see like some of the medical um, covariates explain a, a very small percent of the variance across these individuals from, from this uh, GTEx data set. And we can generate similar pictures with our data. Uh, actually, Luis has generated some pictures for one of our data sets. Um, but the idea here is that they're trying to show in these reviews that like uh, technical um, variables related to the process of generating the RNA-seq data uh, dominate the percent of variance explained, uh, uh, just followed by brain region. And then uh, cell fraction in, in, in like, um, I don't know how to say this color, like, um, Mustard. Mustard, thanks. Yeah, 
uh, Monster, which is proportions of different cell types are like the, the main drivers. And um, in a way we see that also in some of our data sets. Now this is estimated proportions of different cell types, uh, which is like a big minefield or a big um, rabbit hole uh, of how you can get that. Um, so continue with the, with the review here. Um, oops. Let me zoom out a little bit so I can scroll easier. Um, continue with the review. Uh, they start to talk about like, okay, how do you uh, prioritize target genes from GWAS? Um, um, and so we have all the things that make it hard, like the temporal, temporal dynamics, the pleiotropic uh, effects, the development side, the, um, but also like um, eventually we were trying to find TTLs, quantitative traits, low side. We need like enough sample size, but also we need to take into account like what is the tissue that we're looking at or the cell type um, and or the cell type. Um, um, and so a lot of the different studies here, like Mike Gandal has, he led um, a TTL study. That's why they're gonna talk more in detail about it here in this review. But he led a ketel study using uh, psych and code data, or he was part of a, a ketel study using psych and code data um, uh, across different brain regions. And so they, they spent a lot of time uh, thinking about how you can uh, find ketels. Um, and so one of the typical um, steps when you're finding ketel, ketels is to um, adjust for um, 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 peer factors or uh, principal components, um, which we don't know what they are, right? Uh, I mean, we can correlate the principal components against some of our technical variables, and they tend to be related to technical variables, but they could also be uh, related to specific self types or some trans uh, factors. Um, um, and so this is where, like, sometimes maybe we're removing what we're actually interested in. Uh, um, uh, but it's a way that uh, most people have done these types of analysis because we don't have, let's say, enough cell type and specific expression data to then do this um, QTL analysis. Um, and because of all the technical factors that we saw that are, are affecting the expression data. Um, so finding QTLs can be a bit of a challenge. Once you find them though, um, there's some uh, co-localization based methods of integrating that the QTL data with like um, GWAS data. There's also what's called summary based uh, Mendelian randomization methods. Um, Arte has been working a lot with TWAS. There's another method called predict scan. Um, so all of these different methods integrate in one way or another the DNA genotype information or the information about the SNPs uh, with expression. Um, and so like, there's a lot of different papers here that are mentioned, but ultimately this is an active area of research. So there's always gonna be like, newer things coming up. Um, and then they talk about a, a specific examples of how uh, this type of analysis have been done by different groups. Um, but uh, Something here I wanted to highlight is like, for example, for TWAS, they found recently, I mean, some people, some groups found recently that um, the reference panel that you use for these methods can play a big role. And so this can play a big role, for example, if we're trying to understand the effect of variants that play a role, let's say on the fetal brain or the prenatal brain. Um, and so uh, we don't have, uh, like overall, if you, if you try to look, there's not a lot of prenatal brains um, uh, or data from prenatal brains. And that in some ways has to do with like the US laws and stuff like that. Um, but it, but if, if these genetic variants are playing the, a role in that the, uh, early development stage, then it, it will become really important to try to get more data from, from, from more uh, prenatal brains. Um, um, and so overall, uh, replication of these results is still a bit challenging because of the different issues 
um, involved uh, uh, involved with the uh, with the reference panels, uh, the different individuals that you might be looking at, you might be from different ancestries, things like that. Um, and so, how do you validate those type of results? This, for example, another method called attack seek. Uh, however, that that method right now seems to uh, lack the specific resolution for some individual variants. Um, um, uh, so that's some of the challenges there. Um, let me skip to the next uh, section of the paper of the review. Um, <clears throat> Um, so one of the challenges here is that uh, uh, we don't actually observe in a given individual all the possible variants um, um, that are related to the psychiatric disorder, right? Uh, it's more like, like individual one might have variant one, individual two might have variant two, and like those variants might be in different parts of the genome, et cetera. So how do we actually try to integrate all the data? And so this is where, like, potentially might be important to to uh, group or converge all, all those variants into downstream molecular pathways. Like the challenge here also is like if we're looking at a lot of like non coding um, RNAs and things like that, uh, or genes that we have no um, not the best information about what is their function, right? then if we don't know their function, it's hard to let them put those genes into, into pathways. Um, um, uh, so uh, it's almost like, oh, like you could pause time and wait for everyone, for like other uh, scientists to, to categorize the function of every single gene, right? Then maybe a lot of the analysis that we're doing now would be easier if we, if we knew all the functions and how those genes are part of different pathways, but we don't. Um, so that's part of the challenge right now, uh, like working with information that we have at hand. Um, and so trans transcriptomics in general, uh, so like RNA sequencing, like this uh, uh, provides this framework for like working without a lot of this, um, uh, uh, with a lot of the, um, um, like with a lot of the information that we might need if we, if, uh, to do to start from pathways, um, um, and so like any any method that it tr that helps us like um, get an idea of the potential function based on transcriptomic data will will be quite powerful. Um, there's also uh, the uh, new methods for um, looking at regulation in space and time. Um, um, and so like those methods can, can be useful there. Um, right. Let me go to the next page. Eh, we went too far, I think. Um, no. Um, let me go to the next section of the paper here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, one of the like challenges with, with psychiatric disorders is that we don't actually have like an, an anatomical like um, difference uh, or patho pathology between cases and controls. And right? so it's not like we can say like, oh, let's try to find what, I don't know. Uh, I'm just gonna say something random, but let's say like, oh, maybe the, maybe the cases have uh, much smaller brains, right? So let's try to find like what makes the brain a lot smaller, right? Um, that's not the case, right? Um, so because we don't have those things and we like, we're still trying to find like, what are the consequences of these uh, genetic risk factors? And so, We've done a lot of case control studies as a field. Uh, and the idea is sometimes like, oh, well, uh, maybe the genes are differentially expressed between cases and controls or like potential biomarkers. Now, we know that this is not always um, the case. Um, 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 with differential expression, um, 
And so that, uh, uh, that can be here, like uh, the interpretation of these changes can be, can reflect maybe the consequence of the disease rather than the true like um, origin of the, of the uh, pathology of the disease or the disorder. Um, there's also challenges in, the, in, in between, like, like how can you get the, the, these lists of differential expressions to be concordant or not? Like, are they concordant or not? And so a lot of the differences that we've seen across data sets, we uh, attribute them to like methods and ways of analyzing the data or even ways of how the data was generated across these different cohorts. Um, how, how the individuals maybe were, um, 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 how, they, how they were diagnosed, for example. Um, um, so those are some of the challenges there with differential expression. Um, um, then there's also the cell type specificity, which is we're just uh, starting to realize it more. Um, that the, the different cell types exhibit really different patterns in gene expression. And so now there's methods for trying to deconvolute the bulk data. And so here they mentioned like five different papers <laughs> related to deconvolution. Um, uh, there's different ways of trying to deconvolve the data. There's different methods for trying to find like the profiles of, of, um, of expression for these cell types. Um, one of them that is used quite a bit is like single nucleus RNA seq. Uh, that's like we, that's the one we've used also. Um, and um, Kristen Maynard, I think, wrote a little paper about like comparing some of the different methods for trying to find um, um, cell type specific uh, um, specificity. Um, but like overall, I would say like these, these the methods for analyzing these data, like they say here, are rapidly evolving. Um, we've seen this a little bit with like GUIs, for example, in the we're trying to deconvolute some data, and you can just find a ton of papers related to deconvolution in the recent months or, or, or like in the past two years, for example, in a lot of different papers, and it's not really clear like what is the best way to move forward. Um, um, plus, these methods actually have some issues because like, let's say if we're like working with like single nucleus RNA-seq, we might be actually looking at the, the tree prime N of uh, poly A data. And if we're just looking at the pre tree prime N of the genes, we might actually be missing um, important changes that happened before it. Um, and so like, um, um, that's, you know, always gonna be one of, of the challenges of how can you, how can we get like, cell type specific data at a relatively low cost and high throughput. Um, um, so th there's a lot of challenges there, but like currently single nucleus RNA-seq is uh, the one that uh, satisfies the best some of these um, limitations. Um, um, and it could be like, uh, it could be that maybe the, some of the risk variants that we're looking from GWAS there actually might be uh, related to specific uh, cell types. Um, that could be the case. Um, um, then there's also models. So we could look at beyond the human, we could look at animal models, um, or we can do more different types of inquiry and of experiments, like uh, try to answer different questions or generate different types of data. Um, 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 but like, there's always a bit of the challenge of like, uh, like, is everything that's happening on the animal model like similar enough to what's happening in the human? Um, um, so there's always going to be some limitations to animal models. But there's a lot of work that can be done with this, and and um, Carrie Martinovich and her group, um, and other groups at Libre, work a lot with animal models. Um, uh, so we can ask them for that. For, for understanding that part more. Um, it's probably like maybe longer reviews on animal models here than, than this paragraph that uh, Mike Gandal is mentioning, and Mike and the colleagues. One of the last things is like trying to integrate um, transcriptomics with like uh, brain imaging data. And uh, 
So we can generate imaging data using MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. Um, but a lot of like generating imaging data is really, really expensive. Um, and so we don't have a lot of data sets where you have gene expression, maybe DNA genotyping uh, and then imaging data across them. But like one of the big studies that has tried to do this is the Allen Human Brain Atlas uh, where they did generate imaging data um, and expression data, I think. Um, and so what this type of, what they've been trying to do here is to like link patterns of gene expression with spatial variation. So this is where like, um, if we can try to get information about like how some of these genes are expressed in the different regions of the brain at a given age, for example. Um, um, if we see, if we can, you know, if we have patterns on expression from expression, are some of those patterns also like, and the regions of the brain where they're on, let's say, do those regions match some of the regions that we're seeing here being a, um, a variable uh, on the imaging side? Um, so I want, like, I, I mean, I don't fully understand um, these methods, but that's kind of the idea here, um, uh, or like what they're doing. Um, so overall, like uh, Gannel and colleagues, they conclude that like transcriptomics is a great way to go, but it's not the only approach and it's not without limitations. And it's really this static snapshot, right? We are just getting like one, one um, data entry or data point. Um, um, and we don't, you know, we don't actually have like the patterns of how things change across time. Um, like it's not like you can put like a person and, and give them something and then measure expression across the changes there on their human brain and while also maybe generating imaging data, uh, all of that, right? Um, uh, but that's what we have right now. Um, and there's uh, things we can try to do better, like, um, like looking at the different cell types, uh, looking at spatial uh, transcriptomic patterns. So that is where maybe our work with Visium uh, can play a role. And there's also, there can also be methods for looking at local splicing or isoform regulation. And we might need to generate more data at like prenatal um, time points. Um, to try to understand some of these patterns. And so that's what they talk about here. Uh, overall, I would say this, I like this, I like this review and uh, uh, but it's also like a like a pretty good list if you want to find papers to read related to psychiatric um, uh, disorders and genomics. There's 142 papers here. <laughs> right. uh, so if you ever need to find a paper for um, the journal club, this is a place where you can try to find like maybe a sentence that uh, picked your curiosity that you know had a single reference and like that reference will then have you know a couple different pages. Uh, to try to understand more what that sentence came from. Um, cool. Well, let me stop recording.